I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. My name is Gareth. You can use my first name, but not my last name, please. I'm pretty trackable thanks to the military, even though I'm now retired. But I want to share what happened to me and two airmen buddies in the Gunnison Wilderness back in the late 1980s. I was in tech school at Lowry Air Force Base, just outside of Denver, Colorado. I was 19 years old and was in some of the best shape I'd been in my entire life. I'd been at tech school for a while and made friends with some guys there. We got to talking and hit on the idea to go camp and hike in the mountains. On the advice of some of the guys there that had been there a while, we decided to avoid Arapaho and went for Gunnison, which, as soon as we earned the privilege to be off base whenever we wanted and to have our own cars on base, that's what we did. We got a late start that day because of some stuff we had to do on base, but we finally made it out and went up the trail to Lampier Lake. We wanted to get to Square Top Mountain that day, but it was getting too late, so we camped near the lake just inside the trees. One of the guys had gone out a little further into the trees to gather up limbs for a fire, while me and the other guy built up a fire ring best as we could with stones we found here and there. After a few minutes, the fire guy, Brad, came flying back into camp, but he didn't have any firewood. He said he had just seen a Bigfoot. Of course, me and the other guy, Chris, burst out laughing, but Brad was insistent. That's what he saw. Now, I don't remember exactly what Brad was saying, because honestly, we thought he was kidding, so I wasn't even bothering to listen to him, but he was insistent he had seen a Bigfoot. And after about a minute or two, he didn't say that he was just joking. I thought maybe he really did see something, and whatever it was had scared him. We jokingly started calling him Bigfoot Brad for the next hour or two, and in the end, we all three went together looking for firewood. Brad did not want to go back into the trees, but I think he also didn't want to be alone either. We got some wood for the fire, and everything was okay. We went back, made a fire, and settled in. Brad sat with his back to the lake so that he was facing the trees, while me and Chris sat facing the lake. Brad mentioned maybe we should hike out of there before it got too late. Me and Chris didn't agree. We didn't have a tent, but we had our sleeping rolls, and it was a nice June night, and that was enough for us. And we went to sleep near the lake under the stars. Except for Brad, he said he was not going to go to sleep. We said, suit yourself. I don't know what time it was, but it was zero dark hundred when I felt Brad shaking me awake. He was frantic, I could tell, and he was babbling about the Bigfoot being right over there, and he was pointing out into the darkness. I think I said something not very nice to him and tried to roll over and go back to sleep, but by now I was partially awake enough that I was hearing something walking, and I could hear that twigs were snapping pretty near to where we were. I rubbed my eyes and sat up and told Chris to get up, because like me, I guess he thought Brad was just pranking us, and he too had rolled back over and was going back to sleep. Now, we had no weapons of any kind with us. I know that seems ludicrous today, but really at the time... We all thought that the only real thing to worry about in the whole world was a serial killer, which we're all just starting to hear about, and serial killers hunted in cities, right? Yep, we were just young and naive, downright stupid really, but young men in groups tend to be both bold and stupid in large helpings. I was more worried about a bear than anything else walking around on two legs. I didn't know there was something else that walked on two legs other than a human that might be out there. Lampier Lake sits in a basin-type area, Some call it Alpine, and there's actually two lakes. We were at the lake near the base of Square Top Mountain, but on the east side of the lake just inside the tree line. So the lake was between us and the incline of the mountain. To the area east of the lake is wooded, but not as thick as the other areas I've been in. During the day on our way in, there was a lot of light coming in between the evergreens, and their space pretty far apart. That's why I knew for sure there was something moving around out there, where Chris had been pointing in the darkness. There was no underbrush, and there was plenty of space between the trees, and I could see, even in the dark, shapes were moving. But I couldn't see it very clear, but the skin on my scalp began to crawl when my eyes adjusted to the darkness out there a little more. And again, I was seeing movement. And what scared the heck out of me even more is that I saw more than one shape moving. Now I was wide awake, out of my roll, putting on my boots, and telling Chris urgently to do the same. I thought maybe we would have to run or fight. I didn't know. At the time, I thought it was other people, and despite all my talk of serial killers, I suddenly had the thought that maybe there was just someone out there, maybe bent on hurting some other people, 
Or maybe they thought we had something worth taking and we were going to get robbed. But we didn't have anything worth taking. Airmen aren't paid much, and we were paid even less back in those days. The only thing I had for any kind of protection was a small camp shovel, and that was no real protection. The three of us now sat with our backs to the lake, watching the darkness and listening for probably an hour or so. When we began to hear water splashing somewhere in the lake, it was faint, but it was still close enough that we could hear it. We all turned, but we couldn't see anything at that distance. The water was dark as far as we could see out. We were on edge for quite a bit, thinking someone was trying to come around to our backside by the lakeway. But that didn't happen. Nothing came out of the lake and tried to grab us. We kept hearing the splashing noises for quite a while. It wasn't a constant noise, it just came every now and then. We mostly sat there quiet, just listening. Chris and I had made an agreement to sit back to back. He watched the lake, and me and Brad would watch the trees around us. After a while, the sky began to lighten just a little as it headed towards dawn. We could still hear the water slap noises. I asked Chris if he could see anything out there yet, and he said there was something he thought over near where the creek fed into the lake, but he couldn't tell what it was yet. I looked over that way, down the shore area, and sure enough, there was something moving in the darkness at the water's edge. After several minutes, the sky was lightening enough near dawn that I could really see a shape start to form. It seemed to be a bear on all fours, and oddly, that thought relieved me. I was still watching the shape when it stood up. By now, dawn was coming on fast, and every minute that passed, I could see more and more around us. Instead of watching the trees like he was supposed to do, Brad looked down the shore to see what we were seeing, and when the thing stood up, he almost started hyperventilating again and began talking about, there it was, that's the Bigfoot. We hushed him as it seemed whatever it was had heard him. By now, our fire had pretty much gone out, and we had no more wood to feed it, and I didn't want to draw any more attention to where we were. The thing stood still for a moment and then bent down again to do whatever it was doing in the water. Brad started talking again, and I was only half listening, and I tried to shut him up, but I caught that he was now saying there's one of those things watching us from the trees. I turned and looked where he was pointed to a spot about 30 feet or so away in the surrounding trees. Sure enough, I saw what he saw. There was a large shape standing there. It was much larger than the one we saw down by the water. It was just standing and watching us. I don't know how long it had been standing there. For all I know, it could have been standing there all night, and we could just now see it. That thought made the hairs on my arm stand up. The one down at the shore was still doing whatever it was doing, and the one standing there just stood there like a statue. It was now a semi-hazy dawn light out, and I can't give you extreme detail, but I can say the thing had fur that was darker than the surrounding trees and was over eight feet tall. The shoulders were very wide, and I knew right away that being in great physical condition or not, the three of us together would be no match for this thing. So we didn't move, and neither did it. Now, the stalemate went on for several more minutes, but time to time we would whisper to each other about ideas on how to get out of this situation, and every idea was shot down as seemingly suicidal and stupid. The fact was, until it moved, we weren't moving. Now, the light was coming on strong, and I could see the thing a little better enough that I could tell you the fur was much more of a deep brown color, and I tell you, I'm pretty sure it was a male. It was also completely covered in fur on everything that I could see, including the face. I got the impression of wide-set eyes, though I can't say I could see them clearly. Once or twice, it turned its head in the direction of the other one down on the shore, and then I could see the pointy head from that angle. But it never looked away from us for more than a second or two before it would snap its head right back in our direction. The one on the shore suddenly let out a weird sound. Not a scream or yell or whoop or any of the other sound Bigfoots are supposed to make. It was more of a happy sound. It sounded harsh and guttural. The sound was short, clear, and high-pitched. That's the best I can say about it. When I heard that, the one by the tree started walking diagonally through the trees and at a kind of beeline straight for the one on the shore, which meant it actually walked quite near the three of us. It's no exaggeration to say that I think all three of us needed to clean out our jeans when that thing started moving. It had stood still for too long that when it did move, it scared the daylights out of all three of us. I was expecting the worst, but it just walked out toward the shoreline, and I guess met up with the other one, which was now gone somewhere that I couldn't see. 
Now the three of us sat there for probably another hour or so until the sun was up and was all sunny all around. We packed up and headed back out of there. We gave up on Square Top Mountain. We didn't see anything on our way out, but I'm going to say that it was a long hike, or at least it seemed like the longest hike of my life. That was about as much fun as the three of us could handle, and after that, we found other things to do in our time off. Eventually, Chris went on to England, Brad was stationed in Germany, and just my luck, I was sent to Louisiana, which I actually come to love. And from there, my home was wherever the A-10 Warthog sent me, and let me tell you, together we saw an awful lot until I retired. I lost touch with Brad and Chris after a while, and I don't know if they ever told anyone else our story. We agreed that morning on the way back to base that we would never talk about this to anyone else, and not even among us. The thing is, you don't ever want to be known as a mental person in the military, which at the time we feared we'd be seen as if we talked about it. We would have been in all kinds of world of hurt too. If we had opened our mouths, no matter what you do or say, it follows you from base to base in the military. So, yes, we kept quiet. I believe the one watching us was doing just that. It was a guardian and watching us to make sure we weren't a threat to the other one down there on the shore. I guess the one was fishing, although I didn't see any fish, and I don't even know if that lake had fish, but I guess it did. Anyways, thanks for telling this for me. Gareth. My uncle and I were elk hunting near Fossil Ridge, northeast of Gunnison, Colorado, in November of 1990, when this incident occurred. It was late afternoon when we noticed a strong odor that we thought might be elk, so we headed east toward a small ridge, hoping to find one on the other side. As we got closer, we heard the noise of rocks being banged together. As we topped the ridge, we saw a large brown animal squatting at the edge of a dry creek bed with its back towards us. It was banging two rocks together with its hands and making a grunting, growling noise each time the rocks hit. It seemed to sense our presence almost immediately and turned around and looked at us. Then it quickly stood up and jumped across the creek in one motion. I remember thinking, nothing can move like that. It ran up the slope on the north side of the creek bed at an angle and disappeared into the pine and aspen trees farther up the hill. We could see it for about 50 feet before it was gone from sight. It moved really quietly for something that big. I estimate its height at 6 foot 5. It was covered with long dark brown hair that made me think of a yak. It had a strong smell, at least there was a strong smell in the area that was like elk urine. After we calmed down a bit, we went into the creek bed and found the two rocks which were chipped and broken. We looked for other signs in that place, but couldn't find anything else. My family of five and I go on vacation every year. One year, during the summer of 1997, we decided to go to Colorado on a camping trip. We would also always take our dog, and this year my brother took his rat. After a long trip across Kansas, we finally crossed the border to Colorado. As we headed to Colorado Springs, we were going to stay at a camping site, but as usual, we found a place to set up camp away from any sites or towns. It was pretty secluded where we were. Our campsite was surrounded by woods, except to the east there was a long field. Now, it was the very first night, and we had two tents. In one tent was my parents and my sister, and the other tent was my brother and his pet rat and I. I ate a good meal of hot dogs and s'mores, and after sitting around the fire for a little while, we went to bed. It was a clear night, and I remember how bright the moon and stars were. It seemed like I hadn't had much sleep before I was awakened to find my brother's rat digging around in the bag at the top of the little pup tent. Its rustling is what I think woke me up, so I got up to take him out, but I froze as I did. I was suddenly wide awake. I just stared because to the left of me I saw the silhouette of a tall, two-legged creature through the door. We had zipped up the screen and left the cover off. I was, and still am sure, that it was not a bear or any other animal, and I'm especially sure it was not a human. Its arms were shorter than its legs and was covered with hair. I got the feeling it was alarmed, because right when I stopped, it jerked its head and walked speedily away. My eyes were glued to it, and I watched its every move. It walked toward the field, turned around, and I lost sight of it. I still can remember thinking about the way it moved. It definitely was not normal. It bent at the knee, and when it turned, it seemed like its whole upper body moved around. Of course, the next day when I told my family, nobody believed me. But I know, and have known, that it is a fact that Sasquatch is real and is a living, breathing animal. I also believe that it is not a threat. 
Ever since then, I've been very interested in it and cryptozoology. The following information can be added to this report. Stephen was nine years old at the time of the encounter in the early summer of 97. They were camped away from the main campground and near a clearing surrounded by trees and at the bottom of the hill. Stephen was awakened in the early morning hours by his brother's pet rat that they had brought along and was sharing their tent. He sat up to put the rat back in his cage when he heard what sounded like footsteps outside his tent. He looked out the door screen and saw a very tall, broad-shouldered silhouette of a man-like figure standing approximately 8 to 10 feet away and slightly to his left. It looked like it had been walking in right-to-left direction, midway between his tent and his parents. It was standing completely still in a frozen, semi-walking and hunched forward pose. Although there was adequate moonlight, he could not make out any facial details, but he thought it was looking at him. It appeared to be about seven feet tall. The head was described as egg-shaped, coming to a blunt point near the top and flat on the front. The shoulders were very wide and heavy-looking. The arms were held in a swing position with the left arm forward and the right back. The forearms appeared to be unusually long. The legs looked very thick and heavy, particularly in the thighs. There was a breeze and he noticed hair moving all over the body, which was a uniform dark coloration. After what seemed like two minutes of staring at each other, the figure turned its shoulder and upper body, then hips and legs following with the momentum, and proceeded to walk back into the direction it was coming from towards the clearing. Stephen lost sight of it quickly as it passed beyond his tent door. No unusual odors were detected, but it was breezy at the time. Stephen was very scared and didn't wake anyone, but told his family the next morning. My name is Jeff, and I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I've been a big game guide for several years, and I'm in the process of opening my own outfit. I must admit, I've also been skeptical about Bigfoot until now. In 1998, I was packing in two clients into the Pike National Forest. Myself and another guide, along with four clients, were on our way out and got a late start. With only a few miles to go, we were in total darkness along the trail. My horse stopped without command and got very anxious. I assumed it was another animal, or at worst, a mountain lion. I eagerly tried to get him to move forward, and he would not. I got off my horse and led him up the trail. Coming up around a bend in the trail, a creature standing at least seven feet tall and covered in dark hair crossed the trail not twenty feet in front of me. It walked on two legs and was out of sight in two or three steps, but what amazed me was that it didn't make any noises as it disappeared into the very steep valley below. Another thing I found disturbing was a faint smell in the air. I hunt and guide hunters for mostly elk, and nine times out of ten I will smell them before I see them. This was no elk, bear, or mountain lion. After the incident, I was careful to lead the horses to one side of the trail not to disturb any tracks. The next day, after getting my clients to the airport, I returned on foot and was shocked to find a track. I placed my foot beside it, and it was at least another 8 to 10 inches past my boot. I wear a size 10. No one has ever spoken about the incident, and no one will admit what they saw. I've tried several times to talk about it, but no one will admit to it. I have held this secret inside until now. Last year, while hunting in the same area alone, I had a close encounter and was able to observe in length what I saw that night. I was hunting in a remote camp that is a half day's pack in on foot. No one else hunts this country, and I've never seen sign of people in the past. I had made camp at the bottom of a valley that held some remarkable bulls in it. There's a stream that runs through the valley, and at the top, it's cut off by large cliffs that, unless you're a professional rock climber, is unpassable. Throughout the valley runs a series of beaver ponds, and I was camped at the last one at the bottom. I arrived at the valley around 4 p.m. and set up my camp. I started a fire and prepared dinner. After a restless night's sleep, due to the anticipation of big bulls, I woke up at 3 a.m. and fixed breakfast, gathered my gear, and was off by 4.30 or 5 a.m. I hiked up the valley to an area I've always seen elk. This particular morning, the wind was not coming down off the mountain, instead it was swirling. I decided to sit on top of an outcropping and use the height to my advantage and try not to spook any animals. As the sun was coming up, I bugled several times looking for a response. I heard a bull elk respond in the same direction that I took coming up. I quickly started to glass the area in search of the bull. As I was working my way up the valley, I heard the bull again. 
I went with my glasses to where I thought I heard the bugle, and when I glanced around the beaver pond, that's when I saw it. I saw a very dark object squatting beside the beaver pond. At first I thought it was a bull lying in the pond, but then the creature stood up and was looking around. When he looked at me or in my direction, I got the feeling he knew I was there, and a feeling of excitement and terror filled my body. The creature was again around seven feet tall, maybe taller but not much, and it had a short, dark brown, almost reddish coat. It had facial features that of a human, with the exception of a human nose. It was smaller and looked as if it sat on its mouth. Another feature that stood out to me was the size of its hands. They were long and they were like half the size of its forearm. For the first time ever, I was truly scared, not of what I saw, but of not ever really seeing anything like this before and having to face a reality. After at least five minutes of observing the creature, he turned and walked through the creek towards my camp. He then turned and walked up a ridge and stopped and watched my camp, or at least in that direction. After he moved off, I got off my perch and ran to my camp. I packed up my gear and have yet to go back in there. Thanks for listening. Have you had a Bigfoot encounter and would like to share your story here? Please email me, thebigfootproject at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.